So, welcome everyone. I'm very glad that you're here today, because if you're here today, you are likely interested in sustainability, and you want to understand the impacts of climate change on your customers, on your company, on your community. And you need ways to model climate change in order to understand its impacts and risks. And this modeling problem is what we will look at today. So I'm very glad that you're here. My name is Max Richter, and together with me is... I'm Pierre Souchet, I'm the CTO of uh, AXA Climate. And in today's presentation, uh, Max will first dig into uh, what is ESG, environmental, uh, social and governance, uh, an introduction to uh, climate risk, how it is computed. Then we will dig into uh, looking at the features that AWS provides to uh, source uh, and process uh, climate risk data. And finally, I'll present how we, made the, we uh, implemented this uh, at AXA Climate. Max. Thank you very much. So, as Pierre said, we will start with an introduction to ESG data environmental, social, and governance data, and see why it is important for the financial services industry, and see how AWS supports and adapts ESG data. We will also learn and understand why it is hard to adapt ESG data. Sustainability is a priority across the financial services industry, and this is by driving a net zero economy through the products and services that financial services companies are offering and the incentives around them that can drive sustainable change. For example, sustainable investment products can help to lower the cost of capital for the most sustainable companies. And financial institutions are also looking at their own ESG score and their sustainability-related risks, such as climate risk. Regulators are increasingly driving the standards for ESG reporting for the financial companies themselves, as well as for these, office, for these services and products that they're offering. Sustainability also represents commercial opportunities, and we've seen this in a rapid rise of new fund launches. For example, in 2021, we have seen 70% new sustainable fund launches. Environmental, social, and governance data re reflects non-financial data points for financial institutions. And they are increasingly using them as an indicator of risk and performance. Environmental is about the conservation and the protection of the natural environment, you can think about carbon emissions. Social covers the relationship with employees or communities, and you can think about a workforce diversity. And governance covers standards for company leadership or stakeholder management, and you can think about the board structure of a company. So to give you an example, a company with low carbon emissions and the diverse workforce will represent a lower risk than company with high carbon emissions and a less diverse workforce. And financial institutions like asset managers are increasingly using ESG data for their portfolio management, for their risk management, for client reporting, and of course for building new products. At Amazon, we are committed to and invested in sustainability. So let's dive into the ESG themes, and I will give you examples about Amazon's commitments to them. So Amazon is on its path to power its operations by 100% renewable energy by the year 2025, which is five years ahead of our initial target, 2030. We also work to simplify sustainable packaging across the packaging industry. Frustration-free packaging, FFP, is our flagship program in order to drive more sustainable change across the packaging industry. By the end of 2021, more than 2 million products qualified our, in our FFP program. And since 2015, 
we have reduced the per shipment weight by 38% and so eliminated over 1.5 million tons of packaging. Amazon's ability to innovate on beyond of our customers relies on the perspectives and knowledge from people with all backgrounds. We are thinking better, bolder, and better when we have diverse perspectives across our teams. In 2021, we had a 70% increase of black directors and vice presidents, and we have over 100,000 Amazon employees that participate in Amazon's affinity group, which bring together Amazon employees across countries and businesses. Amazon understands that customers care how we collect, use, and share your customer data, and we work every day to earn this trust. We also offer the training that we use free to our own employees, to our customers, in order to drive cybersecurity awareness beyond Amazon. A recent industry survey from a French-based banking group pointed out that 59% of asset managers and institutional investors see data as a barrier to ESG data integration. And this is because the sourcing, cleaning, processing, and analysis of the data requires manual effort. And there are three major reasons for this. The first one, we see that financial institutions are dealing with huge volumes of data. And the source of this data is a sustainability report from a company. And it is estimated that over 80% of this information is unstructured. So getting clear and structured metrics is very difficult. There's also no single standard how companies need to report their ESG data, which results in data inconsistencies, in data gaps, and in different results depending on how companies report their data. And since ES reporting is an annual exercise, the frequency of the data is also representing a challenge. So let's take an example. If a company had a controversial event, let's say an oil spill, directly after it reported its ESG data, this event will not be reflected for another year until it releases its next ESG report. So AWS provides you the infrastructure to overcome these ESG data challenges enabling you to simplify data management and data analysis by enabling you to source and purchase data from a wide range of third-party ESG score provider, industry-level frameworks, and alternative data points. You can then clean, process, and integrate your data by leveraging AWS services that enable you to combine and catalog data as well as to implement a data governance policy. You can then build your own ESG scoring models by aligning raw company level data with industry frameworks and apply analytics and machine learning to gain more frequent ESG insights from unstructured data such as news articles. So now that you've learned about ESG data, its challenges, and you understand how you can use AWS services to overcome these, you will learn in the next section how you can define climate risk and what could happen when the climate changes. So it is widely recognized that continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause a further warming of the Earth, and that the warming above 2 degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial levels could lead to catastrophic economic and social consequences. So in response to that, Nearly 200 governments agreed in December 2015 to strengthen the global response to the climate threat by limiting the temperature increase to well below 2 degrees Celsius and target below 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial levels, which is referred to as the Paris Agreement. Scientists are telling us that we have a limited time in order to do a represented headway, in order to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2050. 
And there's no one company or organization that can do it on its own. And to drive collective cross-sector action on climate change, Amazon co-founded the Climate Pledge in September 2019, together with Global Optimism, based on the conviction that global companies are responsible, accountable, and able to act on the climate threat. With the Climate Pledge, Amazon commits to be net zero 10 years ahead of what is agreed in the Paris Agreement, which is 2050. And Amazon commits to power its operations with 100% renewable energy by 2030. And as I said, we are on our path to reach this goal five years ahead in 2025. So how can you define what climate risk is? The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, is a 32-member task force where its members are assigned by the Financial Stability Board, and they have developed a singular accessible framework for financial climate data disclosure. And in this framework, they define climate risk by transition risk and physical risks. Where transition risks are related to transitioning to a lower carbon economy which may entail extensive risk of legal, policy, market, or technology risks. Physical risk resulting from climate change can be either event-driven or longer-term shifts in climate patterns. Physical risk may have impact on organizations, such as indirect damage to assets or indirect damage through disruption of supply chains. Physi Physical risks and acute physical risks refer to those that are event-driven, which include a higher severity of extreme weather events, such as floods, hurricanes, or cyclones. And chronic physical risks refer to that physical risk that are resulting from longer-term shifts of patterns in the climate. You can think about a sustained higher temperature on Earth, which could lead to example for um, chronic heat waves or a rising of the sea level. To model and predict future climate, it is necessary to make assumptions about economic, social, and physical changes to our environment that will influence the climate change. Representative concentration pathways, or RCPs, are a method for capturing those assumptions within a set of scenarios. RCPs specify the concentration of greenhouse gases that will result in a total radiative forcing. And the total radiative forcing, when it is positive, it tends to warm the surface of the Earth and so increases the temperature on the Earth. So let's take an example of two of the four RCP pathways that you're seeing on this diagram. RCP 4.5 is described as an intermediate scenario where emissions peak around the year 2040 and they then decline. It is the most probable baseline scenario, taking into account the exhaustible character of non-renewable fuels. RCP 4.5 is more than likely to result in a temperature increase between 1.7 to 3.2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, as well as uh, intermediate increase of catastrophic climate events. If we look at RCP 8.5, we see that emissions continue throughout the 21st century. And this is generally taken as the worst case climate-based scenario. But it is still used for predicting emissions based on our current and stated policies. RCP 8.5 would more than likely result in a temperature increase between 3.2 to 5.4 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. And as a consequence, we would have a large increase in extreme weather events. So we have introduced the challenges of handling ESG data, and we have defined climate risk and understand how climate change can be modeled. In this section now, we will look at how you can use AWS solutions in order to process ESG data. And I will give you a reference architecture on how you can process ESG data at scale on AWS. We have introduced in the first section 
how AWS provides you the infrastructure to overcome these ESG data challenges by simplifying data management and data analysis. And by doing so, financial institutions can simplify the procurement of the data and have access to best-in-class data. They can then establish a quality data foundation. They can build their own ESG scoring models and identify the drivers behind the ESG scores in order to meet their client mandates. And finally, they can generate new ESG insights from data sources to create a differentiated ESG offering for their customers. We will go into more detail on the services that you see on the bottom of the slide over the next slides that follow. But here you can see a wide range of services for data sourcing, for storage, analytics, and machine learning that can be used by asset managers in order to deliver greater values out of the ESG data. So let's have a look at the reference architecture that enables you to process and analyze ESG data at scale. We start from the left, which is the sourcing of the data. And you can source different data sets, for example, raw company level data like Bloomberg, industry frameworks like the maturity map, or third party ESG scores from CSR Hub. The data from these sources can then be integrated in multiple ways. For example, the data sets from CSR Hub or RepRisk are available on AWS Data Exchange. Raw company level data can be acquired by using Bloomberg B-Pipe via AWS Private Link. With ESG data, we are dealing with unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data. So a data lake is an ideal place to land this data. So you can use Amazon's simple storage service, Amazon S3, to lend most of this data. And you can then catalog this data using AWS Glue, a data cataloging and ETL service. And with AWS Lake Formation, you can then implement data governance policies. Once cataloged, users can then use the right tool for the right job. So if you want to perform ad hoc analysis using SQL queries, you can use Amazon Asina a service that enables SQL queries against raw data files. If you have more advanced complex analytics, such, a, such as slicing and dicing or drilling up and down of your data or periodic reporting, you can use Amazon Redshift, the most widely used cloud data warehouse. Machine learning is also critical for ESG data analysis, such as analyzing investor transcripts or news using natural language processing. You can use Amazon Translate and Amazon Tr Comprehend in order to translate and comprehend e the investor transcripts. You can also create your own ESG scoring models by using Amazon SageMaker. Data science teams, risk managers, or ESG analysts can then access the data in the way that best meets their needs and their level of experience. So for example, ESG analysts may want to use Amazon QuickSight to access ESG data visualizations. Let's focus a moment on the challenge of data sourcing and how AWS gives you the tools to overcome this challenge. AWS provides customers with company-level data and financial data access using AWS Data Exchange. AWS Data Exchange makes it easy for AWS customers to first find, then test, subscribe, and use data from third-party providers. AWS also gives customers access to scientific, government, and geospatial data using the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, or ASDI. The, sustainability, the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiatives works together with scientific organizations such as the NOAA, NASA, or the UK Met Office in order to deploy key data sets on AWS and make them accessible for AWS customers, such as data sets about weather forecasts, hydrological data, or satellite imagery. And by sharing data in the cloud, customers can spend more time on what brings value for them, which is data analysis, rather than spending time on data acquisition. So now you have the background knowledge on ESG data and climate risk 
and how you can use AWS solutions to overcome these challenges. Next up, Pierre will explain you the solution he and his team have built at AXA Climate in order to model climate risk at scale on AWS. Thank you, Mac, for, Max, for this uh, very interesting introduction to uh, ESG and uh, climate risk and for the, all the tooling that uh, AWS provides. So now it's going to be a bit more technical on some aspect. Uh, how many uh, tech people uh, are in this room? Can you raise your hands just to uh, adapt to? OK, so half, a little bit more than half. Great. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we implemented our data platform to handle those uh, challenges. So first, a small introduction. Uh, my company, AXA Climate, has been founded in uh, 2019. So it's a small company being part of a large insurance company, uh, one of the five biggest in the, in the world. But our company is very small and is intended to work on climate. So we are around 150 employees. We are a recent company, so we are doing a full cloud. And uh, the main objectives of our uh, company is to understand that there are clear relationship between climate and nature, and we want to understand how this, the changes that are currently happening will really impact our customers on the long term. That's the first step we want to do. And of course, ideally, we would like also to understand how our various customers do impact the climate on the nature. So when we started a data platform for AXA Climate, there were a few challenges. The first being we needed to start small. Why? Because uh, many of our customers are worldwide customers, but we have to handle so many perils, so many risks, so many environmental risks that we cannot afford to start with a huge data set with all satellite image in the world, for instance. So we have to start small and be able to scale, we'll, uh, to scale up the model for the entire world with the number of customers we have. The other issue is uh, for many companies, for many institutions, uh, climate change is quite new. Even if we know that it started some time ago, it's quite new. And the business around uh, climate change are not necessarily well identified. So we are trying lots of solutions uh, and we have multiple businesses and all those businesses rely on the same scientific indicator. So it will be really interesting to be able to reuse this, those indicators across all the businesses we are trying to create. And finally, AXA Climate is part of an insurance company. In this area, there are lots of regulation. So we have, from start, to create a platform where we can work in a secure and reliable way from the beginning. So this is a simple, very simple example of how, uh, what kind of data we are working with. So this is a tile of a satellite imagery, for instance. On, on this imagery, you can see that there are two of our customers represented with two colors. And the key point here is this data is really, really expensive. Tiles from satellite imagery, for instance, especially if you want to uh, study them for a long period of time, it, re it requires gigabytes and gigabytes of uh, data. So this data is both really expensive to, uh, to, to get, it requires delays, it requires as well lots of storage. So in a way, we have to find a, um, um, a way to be lazy in order to retrieve it. And it's going to be che both cheaper and more efficient. So as I said, this data is really big, so lazy is king. As long as we don't have any customer as, as in Vegas, we don't need any map of, of uh, Vegas, because everything that happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, you know? So 
we have to, uh, being lazy will bring us the ability to increase the cost of our infrastructure with the number of customers we have. So it's really, really important. The downside of that is doing lazy stuff in computing science is hard. It's really hard. We have large amount of data to fetch, so it requires long delays to fetch this data. And the code that use the code base that is trying to rely on this laziness becomes, becomes increasingly complex. So we have to avoid dispatching this laziness in this whole code base. And for that, there's a solution. In computing science, graphs are heavily used. So graphs are a way to say, oh, these are the dependencies of the various data I'm using. And so we, uh, we chose to uh, go with graph because they will both allow to retrieve the information before actually needing, and also uh, will allow to split in smaller chunks the, uh, the, the code base. Uh, multiple businesses. As I said, we're trying lots of stuff. We are trying lots of businesses. Lots of businesses are failing. So we are, it is very important to have reusability in mind. Here, I put two examples of real businesses we have. One which is we have some consultants within AXA Climate that are working for large institutions or large companies, try understanding how climate change will, will change the value of their asset on the long term. And we've got another application, which is an application intended for uh, private equity investors. For instance, people that do want to uh, buy some photovoltaic uh, fields, uh, factories, whatever. And those two applications do have in common to use some, the same indicators. So from an application point of view, what we just want to say is my applications want risk being computed for flood on wildfire, for instance. Another application or another business will require to have earthquake, uh, flood on wildfire. And the interesting part here is we just focus on the end result. So all the small circles you see below those indicators are automatically found by the graph, which means that everything is automatic. The, key, the customer just say, oh, I want to have wildfire computed, and all the data needed to compute those indicators will be automatically fetched, and all the computation will be inferred naturally. So here, graph is a solution as well, because all the gory details of fetching this data lazily and so on and compute it, will be handled automatically. In order to address the secure and uh, reliability uh, side, we choose to use a colorized data lake. What is it? It's just that we set a specific color for each of our customers. So a customer one will be in green, the other will be in red. As soon as the data of one of our customers touches some, uh, some other data and a result is produced, then the color of the result will be the same as the color of the customer. Which means that, for instance, if you mix public weather station data with the asset of uh, our customer, the end result, which can be statistics, it can be map, it can be whatever, will have the color of the client. Of course, mixing public data doesn't bring any risk. So you, when you mix public data, it, it remains public data. But you can never, ever change, mix two colors at the same time in the system, which ensure that in none of our systems, data of customer one can be mixed with data of customer two. So this is a high level view of uh, how it works. It's a very high level view. So here I represented three different uh, actors that are multiple businesses. 
So the consultant business I already talked about, the private equity investor, which will be using a SaaS application. And finally, uh, we've got also a farming business to predict uh, the impact of climate change on yields, for instance. So let's see how it works. So the private uh, equity investor will use an application. This application will submit the list of assets the uh, private equity investor is in interested with. And as well as putting this file somewhere in an F3 bucket, for instance, it will also create a notification. And this notification will be catched by an orchestration, by an orchestration engine that will start all the computation required by the, by the, uh, the application or the customer. Once those computations are achieved, then we can send back a notification to the application. This can be done as soon as those indicators are produced. And so the, the, uh, the application is now able to load the results somewhere in the storage. And everything is done through notification in that case. So, as Max explained a few minutes ago, there are several scenarios in the IPCC, um, uh, with IPCC. So, the goal here is, first we're gonna fetch some historical data for our assets. For instance, uh, consider, uh, um, I don't know, heat waves, temperatures, whatever. Then we are gonna simulate with every of those scenarios uh, the impact of uh, climate change according to every model we want to, uh, to, to test. We're gonna compute the risk, and finally, we will be able to compute an aggregated risk to the customer, and even uh, display them uh, more detailed information if needed. So here is the kind of model we, we ended with. So at the, at the center of this diagram, you've got what we call the compute unit. So this has parameters. It takes some inputs on the left and produce some outputs on the right. And this code can run on serverless, on uh, AWS Lambda, on uh, AWS Batch, for instance. It could also even work on another cloud or uh, uh, anything. But it's a kind of way of saying, oh, we are gonna take some inputs and produce some outputs. So something very simple. As, in, as inputs, it can take some public data and some private data. When I mean private data, I mean consumer data. Here I represented uh, the data of two different customers with two different colors. And so in this case, this compute unit is just gonna extract minimum and maximum temperatures, for instance, for all the assets of those two customers, and once it has done its job, it will produce an event that would be sent to Evanbridge, and of course, produce the data frame with the uh, various assets of each of our customers and the uh, temperature associated. Of course, it's simplistic, but uh, that's globally how it works. So once we do that on the left, that the result produced. We are gonna inject this in uh, risk, um, in computations that are gonna compute a risk for each of those assets. Once for RCP45 and the other with RCP85. And finally, so it's gonna produce, for instance, heat wave statistics, heat wave uh, risk of having heat waves on 2050, for instance. And then we will be able to aggregate those risks and propose to our customer uh, a summary of the heat waves risk as, uh, as computed by our systems. So, we do use a huge graph for all the risk uh, calculation. So this is basically a huge static graph and it is published, every time we publish a release, this new graph is, uh, is published. It has thousands of nodes, thousands of edges. And the key here is among the, all those produced data, the business is gonna choose a few outputs to read from. 
and all the computation are completely inferred. So you just, from a business perspective, you just say, I want wildfire risk, and everything is automatically added, and you don't have to deal with uh, all the, uh, the, the code on the, uh, or the data set that has been used. What is interesting here is it's a graph, which means that for all this compute unit I was talking about, we can generate some very, very, very specific IAM roles to set up minimal security for all those compute units. Which means that every piece of code has only the rights to uh, read wildfire information if it requires information, customer data if it requires customer data, on writing somewhere else, uh, this data enriched with the wildfire information. It also means that the code can create fancy file in your data lake, and all files at a given time are known within the graph. This is another very interesting uh, thing, because as soon as you know all the files within your data lake, you can find absolutely all the files that are outdated. And it's very important, because all those compute units are working in a distributed system. Being in a distributed system means anything can fail. But by being able to find the outdated files, it means we can rebuild the system if needed and find all the failures very easily. The fact that it's a graph also brings another value, data lineage. The idea here is when you look, this is a real screenshot of a uh, one of our, uh, our computation. So you can see here that the end result at the bottom right, um, we can have a precise lineage from where the data is coming, how it has been computed, and so on. Data lineage is cool, but why doing it? That's precisely because we are in a very sensitive business where science has a huge importance. And with this mechanism of data lineage, we can retrieve exactly which width, which, uh, with which data set we build the data, whether it's NASA data, whether it's uh, 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 University of, uh, <laughs> of uh, Montreal data or whatever. We can have a complete view in, in uh, real time about how data has been produced, uh, and it's very important on a scientific point of view. So now the engine. In order to make all of this working, we need an engine. And this engine is a very simple piece of code that is aware of colorized data. Why? So it has a, a kind of notion of what is a customer. What it does is catching notifications from Evanbridge whenever it has been put from a client, or that's a result of a computation, for instance. And what is interesting here is it can also decide how to work with data. If you remember, when I talked about Compute Unit, I said this could run on AWS Lambda or AWS Batches. So the engine keeps statistics about how much time you need to process uh, some kind of assets, for instance. So it's able to decide by itself whether it's worth to run it as a lambda, which has a drawback of running only for 15 minutes, for instance, or if it's, if it's better to run it on a batch, which is slower to start, but you have a longer processing time. The same way, it can perform automatic polarization in computations. The big deal with working on large-scale data is if every piece of code has to do parallelization, has to do uh, retry and so on, it's gonna be very complex very easily, and all this complexity will be reflected in the old code base. Here, only the engine keep parallelization, uh, use the, the parallelization to, uh, to perform the computation. And finally, the engine can auto-fix itself. It can work either through events, notifications, but we have a specific mode on every night, we run it as autofix. Autofix can find all the outdated results, 
which means that the system heals by itself. So it's a no-ops model. And it's very important for us because we are very small. We are 20, uh, 20 tech people. So having a no-ops model is really important. And finally, it's designed for failure. Anything can break. Anything can be auto-fixed. So this is a more detailed view architecture. So first, the customer uploads data to the API. A step function is then sending data to uh, S3 buckets, for instance, with the assets of our customers. It, at the same time, it will uh, send a notification that will be catched by the engine. The engine automatically finds everything which is needed uh, to, in order to compute the end result for our customer. So it starts this computation. Those computations are once ended, go back to the uh, Amazon Event Bridge. And um, sorry, sorry. Uh, and the, uh, gradually, the engine is able to notify the application, oh, this first indicator is, uh, is computed. This second one is computed, and so on and so on. But it can also, of course, decide to run further computations and continue the process. This is a graph. There are lots of computation. Usually, we are around 700 computations per uh, customer, for instance. And once everything is ready, all the notification has been, have been sent to the application. And the application is able to download the result directly for all the indicators uh, it is interested with. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's this one. And since the application has know all the results, it can generate a view for the end user, for a customer, which is specific to the business. So here is a small example of one of our applications. So this is the application which is intended for uh, private equity investors. So they give us the list of uh, places they are interested with. We compute all those uh, fancy indicators. We produce an executive result where you have just summarized information. But you can also go deeper into details and have specific results for all the specific risks we have. And all of this for around 100 assets can be processed in around five minutes. Uh, so you can have all those indicators uh, within uh, five minutes. And there's a, a small uh, QR code if you want as a video of, uh, about this application. Here is a far more advanced uh, view of what we can do for consulting. So companies usually come to us and tell us, oh, what is going to uh, happen to, uh, I don't know, my factories, my shops, or whatever uh, on the long term. And so we use the same exact mechanism to compute all the science indicator, and then trying to provide them good insights about what is really important for their business to uh, still uh, increasing and avoid uh, issues on the long term. So here, it's another view of those indicators with far more detailed indicators, so people can dive into exactly what they are needed. We can even, for instance, generate automatic slides for PowerPoint, so we can prepare the consultant for having a, a clear view about all those stuff. And the job of the consultant is not then to compute those indicators. It's to find the, uh, the, the important points regarding those values and to uh, give a strategy to our, uh, to our customers. So what did we learn? From a, um, uh, our point of view, the, what is very interesting is in around 15 days now, we are able to produce new indicators. Why? Because uh, adding new, new uh, nodes in the graph is very easy. So as long as the indicator, the public data is available, it's very, very easy to add new ones. To give you an order of magnitude, within a bit more than one year, we were able to produce 3,000 uh, different indicators. 
running on to uh, one, uh, eight, um, 800 uh, computations. And all of this was done with a team of four people. The security was also a big criteria in our system. We didn't want to do an audit uh, every uh, 15 days when we do a release. So we automated all of this, which means that we have more than 8,000 IAM specific rules in our code base, and all of this is generated automatically. So business says, I want to use now this uh, rain data and mix it with my customer. The security rule is automatically added. So every, the security is always exactly the same as the business requirement. And several businesses are already using our solution. We have three, uh, three applications in production. We have also a retired app. This app was working, but the business was simply not there. So we could cut it. And why? Simply because creating a new application interacting with the system takes around three weeks. So it's not such a big deal. I mean, you can start it, and you already have all your indicators very quickly. And so you can try new things and kill them when they, they don't match the business. I let uh, now uh, Max to uh, conclude this presentation. Thank you, all of you. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Pierre, for being here and um, showing us what you have built in three years at AXA Climate. So let's summarize and look at the takeaways from today's session. We have learned about climate risk and its definition, that it's defined by transition risk and physical risks, where transition risks come from transitioning to a lower carbon economy and the physical risks from the physical changes of climate risk including a severe events of extreme weather events. We also learned that ESG data presents challenges for financial company firms because the data is mostly unstructured and extracting this data from an unstructured report requires manual effort. Also, we have seen that the data frequency and reporting frequency is a challenge because usually this data is only reported once per year. And AWS provides the technology to overcome these ESG data challenges, enabling you to source and purchase data from a wide range of ESG provider, company level data, industry frameworks, and alternative data points from services such as AWS Data Exchange or the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. You can then clean, process, and integrate the data using AWS services such as AWS Glue and Amazon S3 to store and catalog your data, and you can then use AWS Lake Formation to put in data governance policies. And you can run analytics and machine learning on top of it to derive ESG insights from unstructured data, for example, from news articles using Amazon SageMaker. And we have learned from Pierre how AXA Climate have built a solution in order to evaluate the impacts of climate over their customers, as well as the impact that the customer have over nature and climate. And by using it with AWS compute offerings, using AWS Lambda and AWS Batch for leveraging serverless computing. So if you're interested to visit other sustainability sessions, you can take a look at the session catalog, search for SUS sessions for sustainability to see other breakout sessions or chalk talks, um, lightning talks from the sustainability um, track. And at this point, um, I would like to thank everyone for visiting this session, SUS 210, Modeling Climate Change Impacts and Risk at Scale. So I would kindly ask you to get out your mobile phone and uh, yeah, give a rating to the session. And um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Pierre, for, for joining and presenting um, AXA Climate. And um, yeah, so before we all go out, please bring out your phones, complete the survey, and I thank you very much for being here with us. <laughs>